Well, good morning on a tu- good, good Sunday morning on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> Once again, in light of what took place this past Sunday, we're uh, re-presenting this message and trust that it will find you right where you're at and, and uh, that God will speak to you uh, just like he spoke to us this past Sunday here at Cornerstone. Grateful for the opportunity to connect this way. It is a blessing to have this technology. We're continuing this uh, sermon series on Your Mind Matters. And the, uh, that's the heart of this, the word, this is the third of four messages. And we'll uh, continue this, this day with a message titled, Using and Leveraging Our Minds for God's Glory. Using and Leveraging Our Minds for God's Glory, which is the best thing we can do with the minds God's given us. If you're like me, you know the mind really is a battlefield in many ways, right? Let's be honest about it. And it's not just you and me who know that, of course, God does, and of course, our enemy does. Uh, One of the articles of ministry, I was a part of the first few years of my walk as a Christian in Texas, a place called Last Days Ministries, printed a lot of articles, and one of them was uh, uh, an article called The Theater of Your Mind, What's Showing? And I, I remember it was just the artwork was a big empty movie theater and one person sitting like in the eighth row back looking at the screen in the movie theater. The point of it being, the question isn't, are you thinking something? It's what are you thinking? Because our minds are always firing and we have to take responsibility for what's showing on the theater of our mind, as it were. Uh, it's a very important question. What's showing on the theater of your mind even now? And then we begin the second half of this four-part series today uh, And as we begin it, we acknowledge the importance of it, that it remains, that our minds matter, for sure, for sure, for sure. What you think leads to attitudes and actions that really do germinate and sprout in the soil of our minds. And what we're going to do today is look at at four different realms in, in which our minds play a huge role in their effective expression. Of course, there's more than just four realms in which our mind functions and in arenas in which there's an impact, but for the sake of of a keeping it contained this morning, we'll look at four very important realms uh, concerning the input and influence of our minds. Last week I shared a couple thoughts. Uh, one was that uh, um, thoughts are more important than armies or, or beliefs are more important than armies because it's thoughts and convictions and beliefs that lead armies. And one of the, my favorite things too is the pen is mightier than the sword. In many, many ways that's true. Maybe not literally in an actual physical fight. But the lasting influence for the masses, a a pen has far more power and influence and impact than a sword that can just kill one person at a time or hurt one person at a time, whatever. And so here's a couple more that I I think are just pertinent concerning the power and the importance of our mind. Pessimism leads to weakness. Optimism leads to power. Pessimism leads to weakness. Optimism leads to power. Something to ponder there. And then this is a great one. Your life is a reflection of your thoughts. Change your thoughts and you'll change your life. It's simple and true. If, if, if we change our thoughts, then we change our lives. And again, it gives uh, more affirmation to the, the premise that your mind matters. Of course it does. Um, and that's what we're talking about uh, these, uh, these few weeks here. So here's the theme. The best way to use and leverage the power and potential of one's mind is God's way. Of course, he designed it. And then the application is this. Know and do what God says when it comes to engaging and employing your mind. Know and do what God says when it comes to engaging and employing your mind. Here's the focus. Here we are again today looking, at, looking to God and at the Bible again. As is always the case, every time we do so, the processing center is our brain through our thoughts. The currency by which the business takes place is our thoughts. Don't think too much about that. But be sure to know that's how it all gets done. It's kind of like, like not spending all your thoughts analyzing the mechanics of what happens when your car engine is functioning properly to make and keep the car moving. Just step on the gas. Don't, you know, the paralysis through analysis thing is a very real thing. Uh, so it's not so much to analyze all this as much to acknowledge is that everything that, that takes place in a, in a context like this in, engages and involves the mind in a big, big way. So I'm confident, I wrote this for sure, I'm confident that this message will make a difference as God has his way. Of course it will. God has his way, it's going to make a difference. And so what we're going to do is look at a few scriptures this this day uh, concerning using and leveraging our minds for God's glory. So, 
first passage we find is in John chapter 4. If you want to turn there, John chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. The first point this morning is this. Uh, using and leveraging our minds for God's glory includes the realm of the realms of worship and witness. And under the first point, and you can find this outline on the post from this past Sunday morning on the Cornerstone, Cornerstone Facebook page here, in the first comment under the post about the message. Uh, the first, uh, what it says under this first point is, is neither worship or witness. Neither can happen fully and effectively without our minds informed involvement, engaged, employed, um, functioning, firing, without our minds informed input and involvement. Uh, we can't fully and effectively function in the realms of worship and witness, certainly the way God would intend. And John chapter 4 is where we find the story of the Samaritan woman. In the heat of the day at noon, Jesus goes to her, to that place, knowing she'd be there. The disciples had gone into town to get food. And in John chapter 4, that's where we find this story. And we're just going to break into it in verses, in verse, uh, at verse 21, when Jesus meets this uh, Samaritan woman. And I'll just read this from God's word. Um, well, I'll start in verse 19 because it sets the context for this comment and this interchange. And it's interesting to note, even before I read it, it's not Jesus who brings up worship. It's the Samaritan woman who brings up the subject of worship. It's pretty, it's very interesting. Uh, after Jesus discloses to her information, only God would know that she'd been married five times and the man she was with was not her husband. Her response to that is, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, and because we can't hear his tone of voice, it's, it's, it's not just that we need to speculate, but again, when you sense the tenderness of this encounter, uh, he undoubtedly he said woman, not in a derogatory way, but in an engaging, loving, kind, and tender way. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worship worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. So again, she's the one who brings up worship, not Jesus. But of course, he runs with it. Can only imagine how his heart left when she started talking about worship, and and he and he directs that conversation at that point, saying that salvation is from the Jews. This is God's doing, and unbeknownst to her, the the, the prophet she perceived him to be is actually the Messiah she's been looking for. She finds that out later as the as the story continues. But but what I want to see here is this, and again, acknowledging that these realms, all four of them. But starting with these two, these realms that we look at today represent ground that we must take by fully surrendering them to God for the sake of his kingdom. Again, we need to hear what he says and do it. And so this, uh, this realm of worship is perhaps the most important of the four because of how worship shapes the worshiper, uh, acknowledging that who we are as it pertains to God can only be true and real and right and good is if we engage with God and encounter God for who he truly is. What you behold, you become in some ways. Um, and so in a very real sense, worship this appropriate awareness of and, 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 and focus on God shapes the one who's doing the worshiping. And it's very, very important. And it very much involves our minds and engages our minds. Because our image of God may not be who God truly is. We need to acknowledge that. Even those of us who've already crossed the line of faith into the family of God, we still may be wrong about some things about God, about who we perceive him to be, how we relate to them, to him as our father, or Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and Jesus our brother, and the Holy Spirit, that who God is is who God is, and our, our, our ideas or our perceptions of who God is may not be totally right. That's why we need to allow him to inform us and to speak to our minds. It finds its way to our heart for sure, but we need to let him do that. Uh, through his word. He's, he's, he's actually teaching and instructing this woman in this conversation. It's absolutely fascinating. So, so 
because of the severity of the fight that we're in and, and how important it is to know who God truly is, we have to understand this so that we can win this battle for who, who is the one true God. Because there's so many perspectives and so many opinions and the enemy is going to try to distort the image of God in our minds and, and, and in, our thought, in, our, in our thoughts as we attempt to engage with God for who he truly is. And, and this, the importance of this can't be overstated. I, I really don't think that's possible. That the, the, the realm of worship fully engages our mind. What Jesus is doing is, is instructing her. He's speaking to her mind and her heart at the same time. And that's what God, God's word does so often. All at once, both and. And it comes first to the mind, through the mind, to the heart. But the mind is such a crucial part of that equation and, and really understanding this. And again, John chapter 4, verses 21 through 24, speak to worship's power and importance. These verses speak to worship's power and importance. Jesus tells her, this is no longer going to be a thing about geography. This is going to be a thing specifically about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And truth is what it is, is the part that really calls us to engage our mind, because that's how we discern what the truth is, with our mind. Um, and again, I just encourage you to read that whole story. It's so, so beautiful. And then uh, the, other, the next verses references, referenced are in Acts. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 17, which is the uh, first book right after the Gospel of John. Acts chapter 17. And in this uh, uh, passage, what we're seeing is Paul uh, in Thessalonica. And in this, I'll just read these first four verses. Acts 17, 1 through 4. Uh, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis, Am Am Amphipolis and Apollyana, um, they came to Thessalonica. Of course, uh, Thessalonica was going to be getting two letters from him down the road. Uh, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. And that's the key phrase here, in witness, in our witness to God. We just looked at worship, now we're looking at the realm of witness. It clearly says that he reasoned with them from the scriptures, not from his uh, best thoughts or the philosophers of the day, but from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Those details are interesting. They're there for a reason, and they tell us that Paul's reasoning had an impact. And it wasn't just the Jews that uh, uh, were persuaded, but the God-fearing Greeks and quite a few. And it notes prominent wisdom, women who had influence in, in that time and in that place. And, and he did it by reasoning with them which again is connected to the fact that your mind matters. The mind of Paul was engaging the mind of his hearers and truth was being uh, transmitted and received and processed. And then by the Spirit's blessing and power, obviously many people were able to not just nod their head, but agree in their heart that this, uh, as Paul said, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. They're looking for the Messiah. You mean he's here? Uh-huh. He was here at this point. He's ascended into heaven now. But uh, the, the, the power of persuasion with an informed mind and passion and the empowering of the spirit, it, it has an impact and ultimately, eventually, sometimes quite quickly, brings clear results, a, a clear response. And in, in acknowledging that, we're again affirming the fact that our minds play a crucial role in our witness uh, of, of Christ and the gospel and the good news. The gospel is the good news. We are called to reason and defend and declare and inform. Among other things, we're called to reason and defend and declare and inform. And all of that, for lack of a better way to say it, fire, requires a firing and functioning brain. We can't, we can't, um, yeah, we can't uh, reason and defend and, and declare and inform without uh, the engaging of our minds. So we see that happening here in Acts 17.4. Paul is engaging it, it, their minds through his mind. 
And then uh, also in 2 Corinthians, turn to 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is right after the book of Acts. I'm sorry, Romans is right after the book of Acts. Then you'll find 1 Corinthians, then you'll find 2 Corinthians. And we're going to look in chapters 4 and chapters 5. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and again what we're acknowledging here is that uh, using and leveraging our minds for God's glory includes the realms of, we looked at worship, now we're looking at witness, our witness. And 2 Corinthians chapter um, uh, yeah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, it says this. Uh, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Whether we have re- Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. And here's the key. On the contrary, there's no room for secret and shameful ways. There's no room for deception. There's no room for distortion of the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And understanding that in order to engage the mind appropriately, what he says is not a part of them, you know, no secret in shameful ways, no deception, no distortion. Now we engage, and when, he, when the phrase that's used here, by setting forth the truth plainly. Setting forth the truth plainly, which again is affirming that in the realm of our witness, our mind is a key part in, in seeing that take place. We see Paul acknowledging that in this fourth chapter. And then in the fifth chapter of Second Corinthians and chapter 5, in verse 11, he, he drills this down even deeper. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. So he's, he's acknowledging their conscience in, by, and affirming their, the importance of their conscience by saying, as far as your conscience is concerned, you don't need to be concerned about our integrity here. That, of course, time and truth go hand in hand. It'll, it'll come out if, if you need to be concerned, but we're saying, and what he's proclaiming or what he's articulating in this 11th verse is that what since we know what it is to fear the lord we try to persuade others that's exact that's that's what this is all about we're trying to persuade other people who aren't yet convinced that jesus is the messiah and that he is the way the truth and the life and that no one comes to the father but through him that that that's their that's what they're attempting to do to persuade others to come into god's family through this proclamation, through the, the right use of the mind. Last week we talked about uh, how important the hard drive is in a computer or a motherboard. Those are both pretty important parts. In the early days of, of DOS, there was a function called defrag, defragmentation. And on the disk, which would be receiving all this information, it would, it would, it would uh, so I don't understand the mechanics of it, but the information would be all spread out and wouldn't be, and wouldn't be efficiently stored. And so what you would do is whatever the control alt function, whatever the thing is that starts the, the process of defragmenting the, the hard drive, defrag is what it was called. And it took several minutes on those first uh, computers that I guess, I don't know, that would back in the early 2000s. Um, but what it did was, was free up more space so you could put more information where it needed to be. And uh, I think that that uh, process in a computer is something that needs to happen for us uh, about uh, clearing the clutter for peak performance, being sure to load it with the right information. We need to do that with our brain, not just the hard drive of a computer. Clear the clutter for peak performance, being sure to load it with the right information. And the ultimate best information, the information that we can put on the, the hard drive, as it were, of our brain, is the Word of God, which is truth and authoritative inspired by God himself. And um, when, again, when it comes to worship and to witness, just affirming just through these few passages of, of the importance of the mind. And the second and last point is this, using and leveraging our minds for God's glory includes the realms of spiritual warfare and meaningful ministry. Not just witness, but meaningful ministry. Spiritual warfare and meaningful ministry. And then maybe the simplest way to say this is we're talking battleground and holy ground. That, 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 that these, these realms of, of spiritual warfare and, and effective ministry are battleground, are, are battle, is a battleground and it's holy ground. And then uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, 
we were just in 2 Corinthians, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and uh, uh, verses uh, 10 and 11. And we uh, read these words. And note that this passage, starting in verse 5, is connected to forgiveness. Somebody in Corinth had did a terrible thing and Paul is admonishing them that if this person's, you know, repented and asked for, sought for forgiveness, then grant forgiveness because unforgiveness brings destruction to the person who's unforgiving and brings destruction to the person who doesn't receive the forgiveness they need from others. So Paul is imploring them to forgive this offender. And it's interesting that in the context of forgiveness slash unforgiveness, the importance of, of forgiveness in the life of, of especially as Christians, um, we see in verses 10 and 11 this. Anyone you, these words, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. And then listen to this 11th verse. In order that Satan might not outwitness, outwit us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Again, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. This is spiritual warfare, very much connected to unforgiveness. Because if we give the enemy a foothold, it will become a stronghold. And in John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life in it, in it in abundance. The enemy is seeking to bring destruction everywhere he can to anything God is doing in an individual's life and in the life of any church or, or any, any group of people. Any place where God is having his way, the enemy wants to tear that to pieces. And unforgiveness is, is, a, is one of the tools that he'll just pour gas in the fire. It's interesting, again, that he says in order that Satan might not outwit us. Unforgiveness can be, a, can be a tool in the hand of the enemy. And don't you dare forget, let us not forget that us harboring unforgiveness is like us drinking poison waiting for the one who offended us or who sinned against us or who did whatever they did to us. We're waiting for them to die while we're drinking the poison of unforgiveness. It just ruins everything. And, it, and it's a realm where the enemy uh, wants to get in and, and take over. And uh, Ephesians chapter 6, if you're a Christian, you've read the Bible a few times, you know that this chapter speaks of what, we, what, what we're told is the full armor of God, which means there's a battle going on, which means spiritual warfare. Starts in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. These schemes that Paul told the Corinthians that he wasn't, they weren't ignorant about. The devil has a strategy. The devil has a plan. And um, if, if you look as it pertains specifically to the mind, we, we find, um, yeah, in, uh, in verses 23 and, and I'm sorry, in, verses, uh, in verse 17, Ephesians 6, 17 says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So the word of God is a weapon with which that we wield to pierce the darkness and cut through the lies, as it were. And the helmet of salvation, of course, what does the helmet protect? The head, what's inside the head, the brain, what, what's, what's the function of the brain, the mind, what happens in our mind, thoughts. The helmet speaks of that reality. You want to protect this area because your mind is very, very important. If your mind stops working, so does your body and your life is over. Uh, if your brain quits functioning. And, and uh, clearly uh, uh, a, con a connection to to our mind's role in the, in the issue of spiritual warfare. And verse 14 says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And truth again is what we engage for the sake of what reality really is. Uh, you've heard me say so many times, the biggest question I think will always be whenever there's disagreement about what's right, what's real, what's true, the biggest question will always be what's the truth? Not what do you believe or what do I believe, but what's the truth? So you've got the belt of truth, you've got the sword of the spirit, and you have the helmet of salvation that protects the, the, a very vital part of the human body, the mind. Uh, so again, acknowledging we're in a, a, a real, very real battle, and we are called to use and leverage our minds for God's glory in the realm of spiritual warfare, and then last but not least, is in the realm of meaningful ministry. 
meaningful ministry. And that's back to Acts 17. And what we want to look at is the 17th verse. We looked at the first four verses in Acts 17. Now we're going to look at the 17th verse and just make this observation concerning meaningful ministry. Acts 17, 17. It says this. And I'd encourage you to read all of Acts 17 sometime today or in the next day to, to catch the, the c- continuity of the context here in Berea, in Athens, as Paul continues to minister. And it's in Acts 17, 17, after Thessalonica, they're in Berea, and then in Athens. And it's in Athens, in Acts 17, where Paul says, where it says, so Paul reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. Again, these people are, are hungry or asking or wondering or wanting to know. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. So again, what was he doing? He was reasoning. What was he reasoning with the truth, the word of God, leveraging that and and inserting the light of that truth into the darkness of their lives for those who are without Christ, who who, who haven't yet believed that he's the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And so clearly, there's that phrase, uh, reasoned. Again, not just in the synagogue, but in the marketplace where the people were doing life, striking up conversations, asking God to, no doubt, d- d- drive the conversation, direct the conversation into a realm where, where we can finally b- find our way to Jesus and, and, have, and have him be uh, a part of the conversation and, and addressing and employing or, or welcoming any questions that come concerning who he truly is. What is this all about? He, he's who? He's, he did what? Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth? And uh, reasoning, reasoning with the scriptures concerning him, who he is, what he did, what that means. They go on to accuse Paul of being a babbler uh, uh, or calling him the name of a babbler. Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, who is this babbler? What is this babbler trying to say? And the other saying, he's advocating for foreign gods. And so again, the enemy is trying to scatter it immediately. So there's spiritual warfare going on in the realm of effective ministry. That always happens. But effective ministry is, uh, involves reasoning. And then last but not least, uh, Acts 28. I love how the book of Acts ends. It's full of so much sweeping, huge things that happen, not the least of which is the former Saul of Tarsus, his conversion to be Paul, the Apostle Paul. And the book of Acts ends in such a gentle, quiet way after all that had happened. And my goodness, the first martyr there, the beheading of, uh, or the stoning to death of Stephen, um, all that the, the book of Acts, the story that it tells, that Luke records, the same one who, who, wrote the, who recorded the gospel according to Luke, the same Luke who wrote the book of Acts. The, listen to these last two verses. Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. Then for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see, them, to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. What did he do again? He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. What does teaching involve? The mind. What does teaching do? Informs thoughts. It, it brings information into the mind of, of, the, of the hearer who is hopefully also a learner who if they're engaging with truth will quickly become a doer of the word, of the truth that they hear. And uh, Beautiful how the mind is also, how the mind is very much a, a big part of, of the realm of meaningful ministry. All ministry is reasonable. The Christian faith is reasonable. It makes the most sense. It sure seems to make the most sense to me, again, to explain how beautiful people can be and how wicked people can be the same person on the same day sometimes. There's darkness outside of us. There's darkness inside of us. And the Christian worldview explains how beautiful and how ugly the world is at the very same time, better than any other, I, I would argue, religious or Christian view. And one of the things, a couple of the things that sets Christianity apart from other religions, quote unquote religions, is Christianity is God looking for us, not us looking for him. And Christianity um, uh, is, is, uh, is led these days on earth by a, a savior who died and rose again. Every other prophet or religious uh, leader, uh, still has decaying, you know, flesh and bones somewhere on the planet. Jesus rose again. There's nobody in his, in his grave. He was only there for three days. For, for what that's worth, and it's worth a lot, for the sake of argument. 
So I'll end with saying this. Um, there's a, another phrase I love about don't be throwing Frisbees in a minefield. I would, I would add to that, don't be playing marbles with diamonds. You may have heard me say that once or twice or a hundred times, both of those things, but they seem fitting here to conclude this point because we're in a battle uh, and it plays out primarily in the mind and the heart. So don't be throwing Frisbees in a minefield. It's a minefield. Get out of the minefield. Acknowledge that we're on battleground, a battleground as Christians, and acknowledge every time we're engaging with another person that God made and, and that God loves, which is 100% of the population, wherever, whenever you're with another person, you're on holy ground because at least two people that God made are connecting and hopefully relating and hopefully engaging in a, in a redemptive way. That is holy ground where the people God made come together to connect. Just so beautiful. And so don't be throwing Frisbees in a minefield. Don't be playing diamonds with mar mar marbles with diamonds. Any encounter with another human being has the potential to be very holy ground where the conversation can eventually find its way to Christ and at the very least to the truths of God, the, the principles he's given and the promises he's made. It's holy ground whenever two people connect. And when one starts serving and the other is being served, it becomes super holy ground. Not unlike when Jesus washed the disciples' feet in the upper room. Tender moments, beautiful ministry, engaging the mind and the heart. So here they're making it real questions. Again, the first point, using and leveraging our minds for God's glory includes the realms of worship and witness. First question, how do you need to change your thinking concerning worship and witness? Both of those realms. Again, look at these passages we've looked at and let them speak to your, to your mind and, and listen to what God would say to you. The second question, connected to using and leveraging our minds for God's glory, includes the realms of spiritual warfare and meaningful ministry. Um, what better thoughts can you embrace concerning spiritual warfare and effective ministry? Ask God to give you insight into that. What, what do I need to know new? What do I need to know in a new way what is it that I can do differently in order to make these realms of uh, where my mind needs to be involved, what can I do differently to make that m more real? How can my mind have its proper place in, in, in all of these realms and in each of these activities? He'll give you insight. And again, let his word guide your thoughts. And the action step is to pick one of the four realms that we looked at and to focus on it this coming week. Ask God to lead you specifically to greater victory in whatever that realm is, the realm of worship, the realm of witness, the realm of spiritual warfare, or the realm of meaningful ministry. Ask God to help you in whichever one of those jumps out the most at you, even as you hear this message, to become better at that. And how can you engage your mind more deeply, more definitively in, in that realm and um, see where that takes you, see where he takes you in that. With you, I'm grateful that God's given us a mind. And let's not forget that he's called us to love him with our mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And um, loving God with our mind. And again, as the title of the message says, using and leveraging our mind for God's glory is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day to grow in knowing and loving you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We look to you for the grace we need for everything concerning the life that you desire for us to know and live. God, strengthen us to serve you and those around us. And of course, in light of a message like this, we would lift our thought life to you. We, we believe that our minds really do matter and we want to know and use and leverage them for your glory, knowing that's the best for us and everybody we know. We pray again for those among us, especially here online now, for all who are engaging with this message uh, through the internet. We pray especially with and for one another. We pray for those who are gathered here who need a fresh touch from you today, need you in a fresh way. Grant them the desires of their heart. Help them to know that you know and that you care and that you're able. And God, we would ask you, also in light of this message, to deliver us from any futile or ignorant or misguided thoughts. Help us to flag them for what they are and then to drive them out, never giving them a place to stay. As we've acknowledged more than a few times recently, we can't do anything about a thought coming, but we must do something about a thought moving in. Help us to reject anything that's not from you. 
And then finally, God, grant us, the, the, grant us please the serenity to accept the things we can't change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know which is which. Help us to love you more deeply and with more delight with our minds, God. Thank you for the minds you've given us. Help us keep them sharp. Help us not let junk in. Help, uh, help us, God, to let you defrag our minds, as it were. Clear the clutter. Uh, create even more space for what matters most and lasts forever. And we love you and pray, as always, in the, Jesus, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. And the benediction today is this. Now go to serve God reasonably, thoughtfully, and joyfully for the remainder of this coming week and your life, in fact, but especially this coming week. Give that, give that everything you've got to serve him faithfully and reasonably with the mind he's giving you, given you. God bless you. God keep you. God make his face shine upon you and God give you peace.